This is not just a war against Ukraine. The Kremlin has been at war with NATO since 2014. This is Jay Martin. As the world continues to erupt into global conflicts, individuals who have spent years in live combat tend to see things a little bit differently than those who are sitting on college campuses. Today, my guest is General Sir Richard Sheriff, who spent 37 years in the British Army commanding troops in operation and combat. He rose to the highest ranks of the military, including becoming the Supreme Commander Europe of NATO. Now, he makes the case that if you want to defuse conflicts, you need to face them head on right away. The only way to do that is to become very active in the conflict. Now, most opinions when it comes to investing in warfare make the assumption that that means escalating the warfare. Sir General Richard Sheriff makes the opposite case today. My name is Jay Martin, and this is The Jay Martin Show, where we dissect the greatest minds in geopolitics and finance so that we can better understand the world. I hope you enjoy this interview. All right, here we are. Richard, I am very excited to chat with you. Thank you so much for making the time to come on my show today, share your expertise and intelligence with myself and my audience. Well, Jay, thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, good morning to you in Canada, and good evening from this end of the world. So just to begin, I'd love to get some some context and perspective on where your head's at right now. When you look at the array of global conflicts, Richard, obviously the hot war in Europe, the hot war in the Middle East, rising tensions in the South China Sea. Um, another conflict that I feel like is not getting a ton of press, but I'm watching sort of closely is what I'm beginning to call the battle for Africa. There's been nine coups in the last three years, another six failed attempts. And these obviously aren't grassroots, self-funded operations. Um, you know, the, the Wagner Group, for example, now has been rebranded Africa Corps and is parading around the continent offering regime change protection, which is really interesting in exchange for natural resource deals. And um, as far as I can understand, Russians and Ukrainians are now on the ground fighting in Sudan. When you look at the globe from that perspective, Richard, where is your attention pulled to as the most consequential tipping points at present? I, I think I have to say Russia's war in Ukraine, because that is existential for not just for Europe, but for the transatlantic region, by which I include, of course, Canada and the United States and the NATO countries. Um, but at the same time, look at what is going on in the Middle East. Um, a war potentially without end, a war in which the protagonists seem even further apart, uh, if that is possible, by the day. I think you're absolutely right to highlight the Sahel. Um, that is, the, in a sense, the underbelly of certainly of Europe and arguably the West. And of course, Canada has there are a lot of Canadian mining companies operating there. So they have to really sit up and take notice. Um, further afield, China the South China Sea, the tensions there. Uh, I don't think that's a tipping point yet, but it could become one. Uh, Xi has made it pretty clear what his intent is there. And of course, let's not forget that President Xi is arguably bankrolling Putin uh, in, in Ukraine. But I have to come back to Ukraine, not least because, well, not only is it that existential, but principally right now, because it is absolutely at a tipping point with Russia now with the strategic advantage behind them, the wind in their sails. Uh, and if we in the West by, and, and in NATO really don't sit up and, and, and understand the potential consequences of this, I think this is something that will haunt us for, for, for some time to come. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Then let's uh, dig into the potential consequences a little bit. You know, Russia began the war, you could argue, a bit disorganized and sloppy. That's kind of normal in Russian, the history of Russian warfare, but they, they end up uh, steamrolling through volume and sheer numbers eventually. And, and that looks to be the path that we're on here. Um, walk me through the potential consequences, because there's a lot of dissent in the West specifically, and I think frustration that the West is as involved. When I say the West, I mean America. Let's just say 
that, that America is as involved in Ukraine as it is. And a lot of folks are saying this isn't our war. We need to pull out of this. Uh, we're wasting resources and spreading ourselves too thin. Uh, what's your response to that, Richard? Well, I would say that this is, this is the, 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 those who say that should understand this is not just a war against Ukraine. It's a war against NATO. It's a war against the West and it's a war against Ukraine joining the West. Um, the Russians believe this is a war against NATO. So they believe this is a war. They're fighting a war against America against all the member states of NATO. And indeed, it was Dmitry Trenin who heads up the Carnegie Foundation and a man very close links to the Kremlin who said back in 2016 that the Kremlin has been at war with NATO since 2014. So I would highlight the length of this. This didn't begin on, the Fe on February the 24th, uh, 2022. This started when Russia invaded Crimea. And this war has been running for 10 years now. Um, this, this, and, and, and the reason I say all this is because if this thing goes on as it could do, if Putin is in any way able to declare victory, and we might just drill into some of that, which, you know, the reasons we might be able to do that, there is no question that the desire to eliminate Ukraine from the map as a sovereign state in Russia will go on. There is no question that what we're witnessing is the resurgence of the Russian Empire. Uh, Putin wants to re-establish another Russian Empire in the former Soviet Union territories. And of course, if he did that, that would bring him into direct conflict with NATO because three of those former Soviet, uh, uh, Soviet republics, I say republics annexed by the Soviet Union, uh, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, are part of NATO. And so if any, if there is any attempt to take over any part of those countries, that means war between Russia and NATO. And of course, that means war with America too. Now, actually, one of your counterparts, um, General Wesley Clark, I had him on the podcast in October and asked him the pointed question, are we approaching World War Three?" And he responded to me and he said, in the minds of our adversaries, we've been fighting World War III for many years already. Um, and the West just hasn't realized it yet. Does that answer align with how you view this circumstance? And you've been talking about the Russian threat since your book in 2016. Um, and so you're far ahead of the curve on this. Um, how, how would you respond to General Wesley Clark's answer? I think he's right. And clearly he's not He's not talking about warfare in a conventional sense, but he's absolutely right about warfare in an asymmetric hybrid sense below the threshold of conventional. Hence, for example, all the interference in the presidential election in the United States in 2016. Uh, why? Mm. Because Putin reckoned that it would be in Russia's interests if Trump succeeded. And of course he did. Uh, you only have to look at the way Russia has behaved and continues to behave and has mobilized for this. And you're absolutely right as well, of course, that we in the West, broadly speaking, have not woken up to the real threat. I think many of us saw what happened in 2014 as a real tipping point, hence the book that you mentioned, uh, hence I wrote that book, because to me, this was, there was one way. I mean, if you only have to listen to what Putin has been saying, Read the speech he gave in the Kremlin on the 18th of March, 20, uh, 2014, the day Crimea was incorporated into the Russian Federation. And frankly, if you read that, you could get, you'd, it would send chills down your spine because reading it would be much the same as reading Mein Kampf in the 1920s. It lays out very clearly what Putin wants to do, and he's well on the way to, to achieving that. Hmm. Okay. Well, why do you think that in the West, we have not woken up to the threats. W what is it about? Is it, is it just, um, that we've been so distant from the array of conflicts over the previous, I mean, you could say, you know, 50 years. Uh, we've been quite distant from the, 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 the point of conflicts. Why are we so resistant to the idea that this is a serious war and needs to be taken seriously? I think that we have had in the West, a long peace. Yes, we've had wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. 
at the first part of this century, the first two decades of this century, we had the wars in, in Bosnia and the Balkans in the 1990s. We had the, the Gulf War in 1991, 1990-91. But these are wars, these were wars of, in a sense that didn't strike at the heart of our, our homelands. And they were wars viewed by most publics in most Western or NATO countries as, as far away wars which, in a sense, were wars of choice, although arguably the Gulf War was, was absolutely not a war of choice, nor were the Bosnian wars. But, but these were far away. They did not strike at the homeland. They did not create a real sense that we here in, you know, in UK or in Canada or in the United States were actually threatened. This is different. This is really different. Um, so, I mean, you ask why people haven't woken up. I'm afraid I think it's part of the human condition that despite the warnings, despite the, uh, despite the evidence, people don't necessarily want to read or listen or hear the evidence until it's brought home really viscerally, until they're really frightened and we're along, you know, we, we just haven't got to that stage yet. Now, that's why people like me, like Wes Clark, I think, have been saying what we have been saying, because we're soldiers. We have some inkling and understanding of the ghastliness of war, and we want to do everything we can to alert people to deter war and to recognize that the safest way to deter war is through military strength, military capability. But, you know, we don't want to do that because certainly in Europe, people prefer to put you know, there is no electoral support for that, although I have to say defence is now increasingly a political issue. But up until now, the money, the taxes, public expenditure has gone into health, education, um, transport, social welfare and all the other stuff. Uh, and, it, and, 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 and who wants to put large amounts of money into, military, into the military? You know, it's expensive. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a big point of the disconnect, isn't it? That the way you're framing this as a soldier and military leader is that sometimes, well, strength discourages conflict. I mean, that's kind of a, a, a law of human nature, a law of nature, I would say. Strength discourages conflict. Weakness invites aggression. These things are true. However, when the public hears we need to reinforce Ukraine's military, add to their arsenal, send them funds and weapons, that's perceived as an escalation of conflict. And what you're saying is, no, 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 this is deterrence. We can't let this conflict escalate. That's what we're trying to avoid. When you say, look, I've got real experience in battle. I know where this can go. Most people don't, right? That's why we need to get serious today to prevent that outcome. But the public hears this and they say, no, you want to escalate the conflict by sending more weapons, right? There's like a third order consequence of this that is lost on most people. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that completely. And, and what we need to tell those people is this, that if, if Russia defeats Ukraine, and it is entirely possible that they could do so, Russia, as I said earlier, has got the wind in its sails and has got the strategic initiative. If Russia defeats Ukraine, be under no illusions. Russia will look to um, annex Ukraine, to remove it from the map as a sovereign state. And you will find, we will find Russian soldiers on the borders of NATO, on the borders of Poland, on the borders of, of the Baltic states, and a real threat. And not only that, but they will have all the huge resources of Ukraine at their disposal as well. That potentially brings Russia and NATO right up, not only right up, right up close and personal, but as I said earlier, Putin has not given up on his intent of re-establishing a Russian empire in the former Soviet Union states. Um, and, you know, so just think of it in sort of cost analysis. I mean, the costs of fighting a war against Russia in five, ten years' time will be infinitely more in terms of treasure Forget the cost in terms of blood, of blood, of young Canadians, young Americans, young Brits, Germans, French, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The cost of that will be infinitely more than ramping up defence spending now to not only def help Ukraine defend itself, but I would argue that the only way that there will be peace in the transatlantic region uh, for the foreseeable future for generations to come 
is if Ukraine is given the means to defeat Russia in Ukraine, not just to defend itself, but to defeat Russia in Ukraine, and then for NATO to build a deterrent band of steel around Eastern Europe to include Ukraine to deter Russia, because make no mistake about it, Russia will continue to be a threat, either if it succeeds in defeating Ukraine, but even if it is defeated itself, it will be angry, revanchist, and determined to return to the fight. And so, you know, this isn't going to be, Russia is not going to go, go away and suddenly reinvent itself as a liberal, plural democracy, as, for example, Germany was reinvented itself after 1945. That's not going to happen. The only way that's going to happen if what is, is, is if what was done to Germany in 1945 is done to Russia. And that just simply isn't going to happen. So we have to recognize that Russia will remain a threat to the Euro-Atlantic region, arguably for a couple of generations to come. Now, would I be right to maybe make the assumption that this balance lies in the hands of the U.S. and with the upcoming election, and you never know, you know, politicians say anything, but Trump has said if he takes office, he will begin withdrawing from Europe and withdrawing from Ukraine. And I would say that NATO needs a European leader, but they don't have one um, right now. I, I don't know if you agree with that. And if they're if there should be one, it should probably be Britain, I would assume. I'd love to know your thoughts on that. There's also division inside American politics. Um, you know, Elbridge Colby, who wrote the national um, security strategy in 2018 during the Trump presidency, and he's a candidate for Secretary of Defense if Trump gets elected. He wants to pull all resources from Europe and focus on China. That's where he sees America's biggest threat. And so there's a lot of vulnerability in NATO right now, uh, in terms of where support's going to come from and who's going to lead that charge. Uh, any thoughts on that, Richard? Yeah, um, let's unpack a bit. There's a lot there. Firstly, um, the, chi the, 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 the China or, or Ukraine. I don't think there's a, it's, I don't think it's a binary choice. I think we have to recognize that defeat of Ukraine, emboldening Putin, Putin declaring victory will say to President Xi, it's worth having a go at Taiwan. Defeat of Russia, Russian failure in Ukraine, will send a very clear signal to President Xi that it's simply not worth trying to invade Ukraine, uh, Taiwan. And my God, an invasion of Taiwan by by uh, by China would generate absolute untold pandemonium chaos and, and be a most appalling appalling event. I mean, your point about America is is absolutely on the nail. Um, NATO, America is is NATO's leader. America, for the seventy five years of the NATO alliance, has underpinned NATO. Of course, it has, and of course, America, twice in the twentieth century, had a fight a war in Europe because American security was threatened. America didn't do it out of sheer altruism, uh, it did it because America's vital interests were threatened by, first of all, the Kaiser's Germany, and secondly, by Hitler's Germany. Europe has got to wake up. Europe is slowly waking up. And if there's one thing that Mr. Trump has done, and I held no candle for Mr. Trump in any way, shape or form, but the one thing he has done through what he has said is frighten Europeans into spending more on defense. So in a sense, I'm not going to give any credit to the man, but that's what, that's the effect of what he's done. And it is having an effect. And indeed, you see this by the way that the NATO foreign ministers at their recent foreign ministers summit set up a, a announced an intention to set up a hundred billion dollar Trump proof defense fund. Should Trump get in and pull support for Ukraine? Uh, back uh, and stop supporting Ukraine. Now, there's a long way to go before NATO can get that fund across the, uh, the line. And, you know, there are a couple of NATO nations that are going to be very difficult to persuade to support it. But it's a, it is an indicator. And you then have to, you know, you only have to look at the increase in defense spending across Europe. Uh, now, in, you know, the number of nations in Europe who are now spending the minimum of 2% of GDP on defense. Uh, that NATO has called for. My view, that isn't enough, frankly, but it's a start. Um, 
about a European leader of NATO, I don't, th- I, if, if, if Trump decided to pull America out of NATO, well, NATO would have to reorganize itself on a, on a massive basis. I don't think he will. I think he could make, make America a sleeping partner of NATO. Um, but it would take a fundamental revision of NATO to, and a reorganization of NATO. Uh, to to establish a new leadership, I don't think any single country can de- necessarily lead it, and I would certainly say uh, that. Uh, I mean, it grieves me to say that my own country, Britain, talks talks loudly, puffs itself up, but frankly, if you look at the size of the British armed forces, which are derisory now, the amount of money this particular government, this Tory Conservative government, in, has is spending on defence, and and what it has done to defence in the 14 years it has been in power, uh, Britain should, under no circumstances, be given the privilege of leading anything until it sorts its own house out, it gets its own house in order. That's a really interesting take, especially on uh, Trump's rhetoric and the the statements he's making could just be almost head fakes, which would be very aligned with how he's run his businesses and politics in the past. You know, he um, will say sensational things to get the reaction from people that he wants. And if you wanted Europe to step up their military investment, you should be telling him today, really soon, you're going to be on your own. So you better get ready today. And that would inspire some productivity. Um, and maybe, you know, yeah, um, Britain or, or Germany to step up as a, a NATO leader, uh, leading, first of all, with investment. Um that's an interesting take. I, I, uh, I think that I like that a lot. I, I feel like there's probably a lot of, uh, truth to that. Uh, if I may just add one point to that though. Of course, the converse. Yeah. Yeah. The other point is that it, it, it is, it's dangerous. Also, he is guilty of dangerous and inflammatory talk. I think on the 10th of February, he said he would encourage Russia to attack any NATO nation that wasn't paying its way. Well, that sends a real signal of America, of, of NATO weakness to Putin. And that's exactly what he wants to hear. Putin will respect strength. He will respect alliance strength. Where he perceives weakness, he will continue to probe. So I think, you know, any hint that, that America is not 100% behind the NATO alliance sends a signal of weakness to Putin, which he will undoubtedly exploit. Right. Okay. I want to, uh, I want to talk about the idea of conscription because it's been discussed a lot in the UK. Um, and so I'd love to get your comments on that. Is this a policy that actually could be implemented without, I mean, inevitably, if it was implemented, there would be massive civil unrest and, and protests, of course. Uh, but is it a policy that could be fulfilled? Uh, Maybe let's start there. Is this legitimate? Is this lip service? What's your take on the conscription conversation in Britain? Well, conscription is anathema to any professional soldier. Um, The British, the British armed forces, particularly in my, you know, the British army, the last thing we want would want is conscription because what you're getting is, you know, no sooner have you trained a young man or a young woman than you lose them. And the strength of particularly the British army has been that core of long service professionals, NCOs, soldiers who really know their business and have proved over the, you know, over generations to be, you know, to be, uh, the, the, the rock on which the, any British military capability has been based. However, my view is that particularly the British army I mentioned earlier has reached such a derisory state in terms of numbers. It's now smaller than it was after the Napoleonic Wars, which ended in 1815. Um, The British Ministry of Defence, this particular government, will talk, as I said, they'll talk big about about being ready for war. They're not. Uh, The British would find it impossible to launch anything more, would find it very difficult to launch anything more than a brigade, 
uh, for war fighting. Now, a brigade is, is, is around about 5,000, the minimum level of which Britain should be capable as a, as a, as a member of NATO should, uh, of capable of deploying for war fighting would be a division. We deployed a division in the Gulf in 1991, 1990, We deployed a division in, in 2003. We couldn't do that now without, without having to spend an enormous amount of time to regenerate capabilities. Uh, meanwhile, of course, you see the size of the army projected to drop even further. Um, recruiting is, 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 is in a terrible state. And if you can't generate the numbers you need through volunteers, I think we have to look and discuss and open the debate about doing it through conscription. So my view very firmly is that the, there should be a proper debate about, about conscription in order to generate the military capability required. Now, there will be many who say that conscription has other benefits as well, maybe not just military conscription, but conscription of young men and women into the health service or into other other parts of, of contributing to the, the state. And that could well be a, 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 a positive point as well, but I wouldn't go there. From my point of view, in order to generate military capability, in order to deter the main threat of Russia, we have to be strong. If you can't generate the strength in terms of manpower and woman power that you need, you have to look at conscription. Now, it won't be popular, but uh, previous generations have faced conscription. They uh, they faced conscription in 1938 when cons partial conscription was first brought in, conscription in 1916 when it was brought in in the First World War, and previous generations have stepped up to the mark. And I have no doubt that despite the challenges that the, the, the young generation of today would do so. But the key point to make them to them is this is not conscription to go to war. It's conscription to prevent war by demonstrating military strength. That's a, it's a, th that point I think needs to be brought to the center more, more frequently. And I obviously, you know, I don't, I don't know that I, I know enough to have a strong opinion about, which direction military investment should go or military engagement should go. But, you know, I, I, I do believe a few things. One of them I already shared that a, a universal law of nature is that strength discourages conflict. I believe that I've lived that in my personal life, uh, in my business and, you know, watched it through the lens of war, I suppose. Um, people don't want to hear that. Absolutely. They don't. And the idea of conscription would be so offensive to so many people. I just imagine the protests and unrest that would erupt in response to it. If I could provide one point of support for it, though, and this is going to annoy my libertarian audience, but just whatever, you know, I've got some investments in Israel. So I've been to Tel Aviv. I spent some time there. And in Israel, men and women are all required to put in two years of service when they're 18. And there is a unity in that country that I haven't experienced, and I'm very well-traveled, but there's a unity in that country that I haven't experienced anywhere else. Um, a sense of identity and togetherness and community. And I, I think about, you know, the periods of my life where I've, you know, maybe shared a deep experience with somebody. You build a bond, right? And you you reach a new depth of relationship that you can't fake. You get there through going through some kind of hardcore experience together that bonds you and you like, oh, you knew about the thing. Yeah, I know about the thing. We did the thing together, you know? And, um, and for example, like, uh, you know, it's, there's no McDonald's in Israel. There's no Starbucks in Israel. They've kept these brands out. It's like Israel made. They're very proud. Now, I know with the, the war going on today, people have a lot more to say about that. I don't care. You know, I've been there. Uh, I've been there. Most people that probably have comments on this haven't been, but I've been there before the war, right? And that's what struck me about that country and, and that community. It was like, wow, they're connected. And I think that's a key play, a, a plays a key role in that is that everybody in that country went through the two year service. Um, and they have that, that bond. And, um, and without that, you know, it's, you get a bit of a fragmented society. I mean, I, I look at the unrest across American college campuses today. Uh, young men and women are getting to blows. They're, they're, you know, physical combat on the streets over a war in the Middle East. And it's good to be passionate about that. But if you're so passionate, then sign up and head over there. I mean, I just, you know, but it's, it strikes me as a funny little, um, replacement for purpose when purpose doesn't exist. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it does. I think it makes sense. So of course, Israel, <coughs> excuse me, Israel, 
since Israel was founded as a state, has faced an existential threat and has constantly had to remain on guard and remain on watch uh, in order to ensure the survival of the state, because, you know, it's a tough neighborhood and it's had to fight a number of wars to survive. Um, and I would agree. I've spent, a, you know, I've worked as a, on a kibbutz uh, nearly, well, 49 years ago, I worked on a kibbutz as a volunteer um, when I was at university. Um, I visited Israel fairly recently as well. Uh, and I would agree that there is, whether, you know, whether you, you know, whatever the politics of it, there is a degree of unity of purpose there in the state because everybody knows that the price of remaining a free democratic state is, is a strong military. And the only way to do that is to invest in it with a citizen army. And so everybody who serves has served has bought into that. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's impressive. Whatever you think about what else is going on. Mm. Okay, I want to pivot down to the Sahel. We talked about this at the front of the conversation, mm. the battle for Africa. Uh, just to recap, nine military coups over the last three years, another half dozen failed attempts. What's striking about a lot of these is they seem to retain public support. Um, and there's, I think, the majority of young Africans now, uh, even in South Africa, I believe, um, like as in under the age of 35, um, have questionable views about democracy. They are not opposed to military intervening in their politics. I guess they're fed up with corruption and looking for change, you know. Um, I don't believe any of these uprisings are grassroots and self-funded. I think they're, I think the, the Wagner group re, rebranding as Africa Corp is the telltale maybe activity, one of them, uh, about what's behind this. And Africa is, a breadbasket. It produces so much of the core necessities being energy and food, right? Oil, gas, uranium, petroleum products, agriculture, livestock, fertilizers. I mean, that, that comes from this continent. It's very important from a natural resource standpoint. Um, break down what you're seeing on the continent of Africa for me, Richard. Well, the first point I think is that you can't look at Africa as a sort of unified block. Um, Africa consists of a range of multitude of different countries. I, I, I speak as a, as a Kenyan born and bred. So I, you know, my mother country is Kenya. And of course, I would also say that Kenya is a good example of a flourishing democracy. Um, where, you know, which, where, where power is transferred through the ballot box and has, 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 has by and large done so, been done so pretty successfully. Um, but I think you're absolutely right to highlight attention on the Sahel, uh, the coup belt, and the the civil, you know, the range of, of instability from Sudan in the in the east right across to Mali, Burkina Faso um, in the west, and much of the uh, spillover from the insurgency, the jihadist insurgencies in the in the Sahel. Uh, is now threatening, has for some years been threatening relatively stable states like, for for example, C Cote d'Ivoire. Um, I think we have, you know, I think, and, and, and I'm afraid, again, this is an area where the West has taken its eye off the ball, uh, despite the fact that I know, uh, as we discussed earlier, there are a number of Canadian companies with a number of Canadian mining companies operating in, in Burkina Faso and, and at Mali. Um, I mean, Burkina Faso up to a few years ago was a pretty benign, stable little country jogging along quite satisfactorily. Um, it's not now. It's in the grip of a, of a, of a very difficult and nasty, uh, insurgency. Uh, and much of this has been developing as spillover going right back to the demise of Gaddafi in, back in, uh, back in 2011, but it's been slow burn. And of course, as you say, quite rightly, Russia has been right in there, um, with Wagner Group first and now with the so-called Africa Corps. Um, and this is dangerous because if those, you know, Russia, if Russia continues to be able to play the game there, this is threatening Western interests directly. It'll threaten mining companies operating there. I mean, I would highlight a couple of, of, of beacons of relative stability. Number one is Morocco and the other one is Mauritania. Now, Mauritania is a really important country, uh, for the West. It has untold supplies and reserves of, of gas. Um, 
it has huge potential in terms of sustainable energy as well. Vast wind farms and 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 being 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 planned and, and solar plants being planned there uh, to generate hydrogen, for example. And of course, in terms of the supply chain, it's a pretty easy route from West from Mauritania to across the Atlantic to the United States or Canada or particularly to Europe. And for Europe, who which has had to cut itself off from dependence on Russian gas, Mauritania offers a really useful alternative. Now, if Mauritania comes under under pressure, then, of course, Europe, European security is threatened as well. I'd also highlight the real threat to European security and stability posed by the huge numbers of young Africans, many of them from the Sahel, many of them from West Africa, Many of them from Sudan, from Djibouti, where there's, uh, from Eritrea, where there's some really, there's a, another really nasty war going on, not Djibouti, but Eritrea, another really nasty fight war going on. Huge numbers of refugees and asylum seekers taking to the Mediterranean on leaky boats, either dying in the Mediterranean in droves or coming ashore as illegal immigrants. So this is really, this is really having an impact on European stability right across the continent. Um, much of it because of conflict, because of poverty, uh, and because um, because of lack of capacity and, and fragile states, particularly in the Sahel. And Russia now has an increasing grip. So this is a real problem, a real strategic issue for, for Europe and, and arguably for the transatlantic region. And in my view, I think this is something that NATO should be looking at. And the West should be looking at means of providing supporting fragile states to build stability because from stability comes prosperity and from from prosperity uh, comes a degree of security. So it's a virtual circle. Security comes first, though. So this is a really important area to think about and to look at. Do you think Russia's intention or maybe China's intention with the Sahel is to control those resources and politics, or is it just simply to keep the West out? I think both. Or I think absolutely both. Uh, I think I think Wagner Group initially and now Africa Corps see see the resources of West Africa, the mineral resources, uh, and, and and the Sahel, the mineral resources, and indeed not just Western Africa and the Sahel, but Central Central Africa, the Central African Republic, huge forestry resources, which 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 the Russians are taking advantage of, as a sort of down payment for providing security for corrupt um, autocratic leadership. And so I'd, I'd love, okay, so Africa Corps, as I understand it, I'd love to get your comments on this. This was the Wagner Group, now infamous Wagner Group, rebranded, and their intention is to promise support to African regimes in exchange for discounted deals on access to natural resources, which they can then funnel back to Russia is is that a sufficient understanding of the the organization, what they're doing, and why? I think that's a pretty 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 neat neat summary. But I would also say to your first point, it, it, it's also about um, impacting on Western Western interests to by by denying the West access to resources which hitherto they have enjoyed. For example, Niger, uranium, France was very much you dependent on Nigerian uh, uranium, which, of course, has now been denied to them. And, of course, who's going to like a lot of uranium? The Russians are. Yeah. 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 There's a company, Goviex, which we've had on the show here. They've got uranium projects in Niger. Uh, we've been watching that story quite closely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. And when you look at – so just to move over to the other – uh, part of the globe we haven't discussed yet, the South Pacific. President Xi, as I understand, has told his military command he wants them to be ready for a successful invasion of Taiwan by 2027. Hasn't said he's going to do it, but he said he's told his military, I want you ready for a successful invasion of Taiwan. How would you process that statement? Is that a threat to the world to put everybody on notice? Is it legitimate and he wants his military there or is it a veiled intention and invasions more likely than not? Uh, well, I think it is absolutely a statement of intent and it is putting the world on, the world should certainly sit up and take notice of that because 
uh, a Chinese invasion of, of, of Taiwan would be more than catastrophic for the global economy. It would be catastrophic for the Chinese economy as well, of course, because of the Chinese, the large proportion of, of, of Taiwanese goods, goods that are, that are manufactured in Taiwan and that, to, that Chinese industry is dependent on. Um, so what? So again, how can a degree, how can China be deterred? I, I think the jury is out about the intent. I don't think it's as clear and unambiguous as Putin's intent in Ukraine, for example. And I know many China specialists with much greater depth and understanding of China than I can possibly begin to, to have, who would say that they do not necessarily believe that China, that President Xi will, will attack Taiwan. Number one, because of the impact on the Chinese economy. And number two, because of the, the you know, don't forget, don't underestimate the military difficulties of doing so. However, as we discussed earlier, if President Xi sees Putin getting away with military, with a military assault on a neighbor uh, in Ukraine, I think the chances are that the probability would increase of a Chinese assault on Taiwan. So what? So deterrence is the key. Of course it is. It's also about recognizing the linkage between success in Ukraine for Ukraine and a successful deterrent capability. A failure by the West to, to uh, support Ukraine, resulting in Ukrainian defeat, will demonstrate to President Xi that the West simply hasn't got the, the guts or the, the, the strength or the will to stand up to auto autocrats and, and, and will, in a sense, give him a green light to move forward. Um, so what? The West has got to think about how to deter, led, of course, by America. And of course, America has got to be, it, it is a, a massive threat to American security and your American interests. Um, I would also highlight the importance of Australia here, but also finding ways to bring together, um, in, in an alliance cape, in, in an alliance construct, a coalition or alliance of, of like-minded nations in the, in the region, in the Asia Pacific region to, to deter China. Uh, and if that can be done under American leadership, um, I think it's a far, a hell of a stretch to say to try and create a sort of Asia Pacific version of NATO. NATO has been around for a long time. But on the other hand, NATO has Germans really demonstrates what an alliance can do to deter aggression. What's your take? And, and do you have one on President Xi's trip to San Francisco last year? Janet Yellen's follow-up trip to Beijing this year because a lot of the, um, well, if, if, if they're serious about making a move on Taiwan, it's, it strikes me as maybe they're playing two games. President Xi is in San Francisco essentially uh, seemingly begging for foreign investment again, right? Coming to America, meeting with American business leaders saying, look, I mean, foreign direct investment's falling off a cliff in China. He needs that back for sure. It, it will be playing two games, though, to be um, trying to rebuild ties with American business on one hand while preparing for an invasion of Taiwan on the other. And those two things seem to me to be in conflict. But I could also very well be misunderstanding President Xi's intention in San Francisco and what he was doing here and some other takes that I've heard from um, like Eric Prince of, of Blackwater is that now he was um, – essentially asserting dominance when he was in San Francisco that this, so what's your take, Richard? Do you have one on that? Yeah, I, I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think that, that, that clearly mil Chinese military strength, capability, power depends on a strong Chinese economy. Uh, the Chinese economy for all its strength in the early years of the 20th century has been, has, has faltered in the last couple of years. I wouldn't, you know, say massively but of course in China by Chinese standards of growth it has it hasn't continued to power ahead and has faced real problems in the real estate and other markets as well so, so what so look for foreign and direct investment look for ways to build up the Chinese economy and you know what you don't necessarily just because he might be folk, you know planning aggressive military operations doesn't mean he doesn't recognize the importance of of, of building that strong economy. I mean, I think uh, there's an interesting historical parallel here. People said the pre, before the First World War in Europe kicked off in, in, in August 20, 1914, a lot of people said 
a war would be impossible because of the interdependence of European economies. It was possible, despite Mm. the interdependence of European economies, partly because the Kaiser's Germany has been building up real military capability and had been planning uh, planning a two-front war which would involve taking out uh, taking out France before turning its attention to Russia. Uh, and when the, the Archduke was assassinated in 1914, uh, the, you know, the wheels turned and, and before the, the Europe knew it, it was in, in, in a cataclysm. So wars happen through, through mishap as much as anything. Yeah, wars are like riots. They often start by accident, um, oft, often the case. My last question for you, Richard, would be a, a lot of the conversations I have on this channel with macroeconomists and finance experts paints a pretty dire picture of the United States in terms of their um, uh, descent from power, right? Global influence, uh, percent of global trade, their balance sheets, a disaster, all of this stuff. And in finance, people love to paint doom and gloom pictures. It's, it's a big part of the business and it's often very, very incorrect in my opinion. It's easy to be sensational, um, and skip facts. If you were to look at the grand cycle of American empire and maybe even hold it up to like the, the grand cycle of the Dutch empire and the British empire. And, and now we're in the era of the American empire. Have we entered the sunset years? Is it, is it too unclear to tell? Or do you have any thoughts on where we might be in the cycle of American power? Uh, I, I, I don't see American economic power being challenged in the next generation. I, I don't think China will overtake America. Um, I think America will remain the pre- preeminent military power on the globe. But what I do see is the pendulum of American isolationism swinging back towards isolationism. I see America having, and its coalition partners, having failed in Iraq, having failed in Afghanistan. Uh, I see a lack of confidence. I see a reluctance to be the world policeman in a way which in which America was you know, a burden America was prepared to, to shoulder after the, the Second World War. And understand that, you know, one can understand that in American electorates and towns and cities. You know, why should we be doing this? Why should our, our soldiers be, you know, solving every problem around the globe? And why should we make those sort of sacrifices? Um, but so there is a mismatch between that economic power, that economic strength, that, and that military strength and American confidence, I think, and American willingness to, to shoulder the burden. But what I can say is that if America does that pendulum of isolation, American isolation does swing back away from commitment overseas, commitment in Europe, commitment in around the world, American security will will be jeopardized. As I said earlier, America didn't get involved in two world wars in Europe in 1917 and 1941 out of altruism. It did it because American interests were threatened. Uh, and American interests will continue to be threatened around the world. And the only way to secure American interests will be through deterrence, which means America needs to have and continue to have a, a global presence. Okay. Look, um, Richard, I want to thank you for coming on the show today and chatting with me and allowing me to, to pick your brain on a handful of topics that I'm trying to understand better and leverage your experience. And, and thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Jay, thank you very much for the privilege of joining you and uh, good luck to you. All right.